Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Rothaker. I'm the coordinator for Summer Forum for this year. And this is number five of 10 Summer for Forum programs. Uh, today's program, of course, is about climate change and what you can do. Um, uh, the format, uh, if you haven't been to previous ones, is we have a, we have a panel uh, and they will uh, discuss things. Steve Glazer is our team coordinator and sh he'll direct traffic on that. And then we, uh, about 40 minutes in or 45 minutes in, we'll pass the collection plate and we hope you'll donate generously. Summer Forum, uh, we need your vote and support for Summer Forum because we do have expenses uh, we have to pay our technical expert, Tristan Moore, up there, who, without his help, these programs would not work. <laughs> and, uh, and we need to show the church administration that people support this uh, summer forum pro format. And we hope you will all uh, come to uh, future programs. I'll mention those in a second. Uh, if anyone wants to help out, uh, we need help uh, making coffee for future programs, so uh, get with the people in the kitchen and uh, they'll take your name and uh, you can help out with that. Online, um, uh, people that attend online, if uh, we could maybe have you sign up uh, to help out with the virtual coffee hour. Um, it's very simple and Linda Smith can help you with that. Okay, um, it, it will, af after the collection plate, we'll have a question and answer period, so please make note of any questions you have and keep them uh, as short as possible. Don't uh, have a long dissertation uh, because there'll be a lot of questions on, give, especially given the topic today. And the panel, please be as succinct as possible and still um, uh, answer the questions as best you can. Uh, and uh, again, please talk into the microphones because we've got the sound turned up as loud as it can go without generating feedback. Um, uh, the upcoming programs next week, we're going to have a sing-along. Uh, Jim Thornburg and Lori Shields will be up here with their guitars and microphones. The, uh, the audience will have to mask uh, according to the county rules, but we'll have some extra fans to move the air through, and uh, that should be fun. Uh, Unitarians like arts, as we had last week, and music, as well as thoughtful discussions. Um, uh, please get active after this uh, program. Write letters, uh, join groups. Uh, the Citizens Climate Lobby has a table out here. Uh, we encourage uh, Unitarians believe that what's important is what we do on Earth to make the world a better place. And so, whether you're Unitarian or not, we hope you agree with that, and uh, we'll get active. Uh, there will be a social hour after the program out on the patio, and, and there's coffee and, uh, available. So you'll, we hope you'll join that, and please try and make two new friends. It's easy to talk to the people you know all the time, but that's what it is fun about these programs. And with that, please give a warm welcome to Steve Glazer, uh, our uh, member at this church who put this program together, and we'll go from there. Give him a good welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today, giving up the last vestiges of the time you could be outside and still be a little bit comfortable. <laughs> Opinion polling has shown that people's concern with climate goes up significantly as the temperature goes up, which probably explains why we have such a great turnout today. <clears throat> um, you read in the news where a lot of bad things going on, whether it's the Great Salt Lake and how it's drying up, or you know what's happening in our winters. You see with um, at the federal level, and we just had a Supreme Court ruling that greatly limited what EPA can do to address climate change, and it looks like Congress isn't going to be doing anything about 
climate change in the next few months based on Joe Manchin's decision. But with this forum, we want to talk about certain things. First of all, things that you may not know about happening in Salt Lake City and in Utah as a result of climate change. Also, what, how things may not be quite as sad a state as you might anticipate for getting legislation passed, and also what you can do about it. So our first speaker is Jesse Stewart. Um, Jesse is the Deputy Director of Salt Lake City Department of Public Utilities. And that includes drinking water treatment and distribution, and includes sewer collections and treatment, stormwater quality and flood control. All those things may be affected by climate change. He's also responsible for street lighting, which I really hope is not affected by climate change. <clears throat> Um, but he's involved with water reclamation and engineering, operations and maintenance divisions, and he's a professional geologist, and long ago in his history, he worked at an engineering consulting firm evaluating toxic waste sites. So, Jesse. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. As Steve mentioned, I'm the Deputy Director with Public Utilities. Um, I'm going to start off today uh, give me a little bit of an overview about my department, uh, and then I'm going to go into some of the vulnerabilities we're seeing uh, for water in this in our in our collection area and in our distribution area, and then some of the strategies that we're having those. And I think with climate change, any of the vulnerabilities I talk about are only exacerbated by climate change as we go forward. Uh, as as Steve mentioned um, briefly, there uh, our, the Salt Lake City Public Utilities uh, is responsible for delivering. Um, culinary water to about 350,000 people. Uh, that's projected to grow um, uh, by about 100,000 by 2060. And that our distribution area goes from the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon across the East Bench through portions of Cottonwood Heights, Murray, Holiday, a little bit into mid, like very small portions of Midville, uh, Murray, and, and uh, South Salt Lake, and then all of Salt Lake City proper. Um, we own and operate three water treatment plants, one up in Little Cottonwood, or one up in uh, City Creek. Uh, one at the mouth of Big Cottonwood and one at the base of the historic um, Concrete Arch Dam below Mountain Dale Dam. And then we also get water through the Metropolitan Water District of Salt Lake and Sandy, which comes from Little Cottonwood and the Deer Creek system. And then through exchange agreements that they've got, we also get water that's treated by the Jordan Null, or the uh, Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District, which comes along the west side and into the northwest portions of the city. Um, so again, that's we're, we're trying to continue to uh, manage our water water sheds up in the Cottonwood Canyons uh, with source protection, treatment, and then delivery through about 1,300 miles of pipeline to the taps that a lot of you probably uh, get your drinking water out of. Again, meeting EPA and Safe Drinking Water Act and uh, State of Utah water quality goals. Our sewer system is limited to, all the other utilities we have are limited to Salt Lake City proper. Uh, sewer is all the collections within Salt Lake City, and then we have a single sewer treatment plant uh, located out on the north side of town, kind of between Chevron Refinery and um, I believe it's Marathon Refinery. They keep changing their name, but out, out on the north side. Uh, and that treats about 30 million gallons of water a day. That discharges to, uh, through a canal system out to Farmington Bay. Uh, our stormwater system, we're responsible for both stormwater control uh, flood mitigation as well as water quality and that goes um, you know a lot of the everything through Salt Lake City it either goes into the creeks or the Jordan River and then ultimately out to uh, the Great Salt Lake. Uh, street lighting as Steve mentioned uh, we also do street lighting that's not necessarily limited by climate um, by uh, climate change but it is a big energy uh, user uh, we're in the process now we just finished our master plan and we're in the process of converting everything to high efficiency LED uh, from you know older technologies that aren't quite as energy efficient. So we have about 16,000 lights across the city that we're responsible for. Um, so some of the vulnerabilities. Um, it's one thing I always look at with our supply and demand. So we get a lot of our water straight from the Cottonwood Creeks. So as the supply is high during the springtime, our demand's low. And this time of year, demand's high and water's going down lower. So we also have stored water in the Deer Creek system that we pull from and about 26 deep groundwater wells that we also pull from. So those are all um, 
vulnerabilities that we're, we'll be addressing as we go forward with uh, changes in precipitation. Uh, climate change might give you know, more water but the wrong time and in the wrong form. We really like snow because that's our virtual reservoir up in the mountains that sustains us through the dry periods as long as we can continue to get those creek flows going. Uh, snowpack decrease is another one. Earlier runoff timing, like I said, right now we're already, we're kind of like this in our supply and demand and it might become more like that. So we'll get farther and farther apart. Uh, drought intensification, storm intensification, uh, water quality degradation, and then catastrophic fire in the watershed. And here's, here's a couple of things we've experienced recently. So water quality impacts. Uh, upper left is uh, Utah Lake back in 2016, and we're continuing to struggle with harmful algal blooms. Um, you might not understand why Utah Lake would affect us so much here in Salt Lake City, but we have over 100-year-old agreements with old irrigation companies that we exchange Utah Lake water for the more pristine water from the Cottonwood Canyons for treatment. Um, you might notice if you drive down 17th South uh, in the summertime, you'll see water running in the gutter. That is exchange agreement water that we're, we're pushing down to, to meet these old exchange agreements with users that are still on that parlay exchange or someplace down throughout the rest of our distribution system, we're meeting these exchanges. Um, Parley's Canyon wildfire. This was last summer. A dragging chain started a fire up in Parley's Canyon. Like I mentioned, we've got two reservoirs. Well, I mentioned we have a water treatment plant up there, but also two water reservoirs that we store water in. Uh, Little Dell Reservoir and Mountain Dell Reservoir. And then storm intensification. This is from 2017. We had some big microbursts where we got 200-year events in a, not, not even a day, in a couple, half hour, an hour, uh, which causes local flooding. We can't design for those 200 year events, otherwise the streets would just be full of gigantic pipes the whole time, but we're, we're, we're doing new stormwater master plans to address those sorts of things. So some of the strategies, we do planning, operational, capital infrastructure and sustainability planning to make it, to get us through some of these vulnerabilities. And like I mentioned, those are only exacerbated by climate change. Uh, so some of the planning strategies, uh, we work and we do climate risk evaluations. We're working with the University of Utah right now doing a climate study and how we can um, address any climate, any climates that hit us or, or, or I guess annual events that we that come across and we're dealing with every year and trying to figure out better ways to predict that. Um, that would be actually a really interesting thing to have um, Dr. Court Strong come in and give a talk on some of the interesting things he found with Atlantic, it's called the Atlantic Dipole and how that affects our, our, what, our weather here. So what you're getting in the Atlantic truly affects annual weather patterns here. I'm not gonna go into that because I'd butcher it and he'd, he'd be the better person to come in anyway. Uh, we're also doing major water supply and demand studies. We just finished that and that guides us um, you know, every year up to 2060 depending on what we see for growth what we see for water resources, what we're going to have to do to develop more water resources, and how we're going to best use the ones we have now. Uh, emergency response plans, stormwater master plans, and again, working with USU and, and uh, the University of Utah. Some of the things we're doing with USU, they're doing a, a turf study for us, and we're working with our golf courses to change out turf to more drought-resistant turfs instead of Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and then forums like this, being, being with people to work on things. And then also we're very involved in Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake because they both have issues with water quality and water volume. Um, operational strategies, uh, again, like I said, we're partnering with a lot of different folks on climate studies, um, conservation plans, aeration on reservoirs to keep harmful algal blooms from coming on, rain barrel programs. Uh, we've got a really good conservation um, um, Website, if you just do Salt Lake City Public Utilities Conservation, there's a lot of activities there. You can do water checks, that's what this upper right hand corner is. USU will come in and test your sprinkler heads, look at your, um, what type of, uh, you know, grass, plants, shrubs, whatever you've got, and they can help dial in what you should best be doing for irrigation. Uh, capital infrastructure, um, we've got a huge budget. We've, we're again responsible for water, sewer, storm water. Uh, we're trying to replace aging infrastructure, work on uh, lost water. You can think of that as leak detection or how we mitigate you know, hydrant flushing, what we're doing with uh, accounting for that lost water and making sure that we're not losing it as it travels through those 1,300 miles of pipes. Um, we're building a new wastewater treatment plant right now to meet new regulations that will help with Great Salt Lake. Um, and we're doing piloting green infrastructure programs for stormwater. You'll see a lot of those coming down the road, coming in the roads, down the road. 
energy climate nexus, um, renewable energy plan implementation. We're really trying to be the best we can there. Uh, I got a picture here on the lower right. I'm pointing to my screen. I should point you to that screen. Uh, that's when Big Cottonwood Canyon, our Big Cottonwood Water Treatment Plant was built back in the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, we're in the process now of designing that anew. Um, it's, it's reached its, its useful life. We're going to be rebuilding that. Some of the things we looked at is putting in a different spot, which would include a lot of pumping costs. And we decided we're going to put it right back where it is. Um, so that we can use it as a gravity feed plant. It gravity feeds most of Salt Lake City's distribution area. And also we're working with Metropolitan Water District to put in a raw water pipeline between Little Cottonwood plant and Big Cottonwood so that when we take it offline, we can still use that water resource. And then when they rebuild their plant, they can use that water resource. And then eventually that might turn into a pipeline for aquifer storage and recovery, which is, again is one of our strategies. And then working with uh, Rocky Mountain Power to best um, implement water energy saving strategies. And with our street lighting program, like I mentioned, 16,000 lights, that uses a lot of electricity. So we're doing what we can to reduce that load. Um, our decision criteria, again, we have to look at risk on everything. Everything, all of our components of our systems have a condition of criticality and a risk to not doing something, to doing something. Risk to climate change, you know, what are we, what are we looking at? We've got to look at aquifer storage and recovery for new sources, new groundwater wells. Um, how best to utilize our surface water, and then conservation. Um, conservation, we are doing really well. We're well below the last three-year average and millions of gallons below last year. I was, I was mentioning it to these folks before that, before we started going, our conservation program is always cheering that and our finance group is always cringing because you know, the less water we sell, the less water we have to do the improvements we need to go forward. So our business model isn't the greatest, but it works for us. Sell as little as possible for as little as possible. That's not taught at, at any big business schools, I don't think. Um, so, so again, looking at the time frame, political feasibility, the city is also doing some things. We've put in some new legislation or new uh, ordinance to limit large water users. So we're, I'll, I'll go and cut off now, um, but again, there's a lot of regulatory and legal issues with water rights in the state and how we use those. But I'll save that for some questions as we go. Okay, thanks. So Tom Moyer is the Utah State Coordinator for Citizens Climate Lobby. And that's a nonpartisan group that works with both political parties to create the political will for a livable world. And CCL was instrumental in forming the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus in Congress and worked with the Utah Legislature to pass a resolution in 2018. It was the Environmental and Economic Stewardship Resolution. He's a mechanical engineer. He works for HDT Robotics on Explosive Ordnance Disposal Robots. And he and his wife, Lauren Barros, live in a net zero house that they built in Park City. All right, thank you for having me. All right, I'm gonna give you the brief case for climate optimism right now. It's easy to get down at the moment and in the process tell you a little bit about what we do with Citizens Climate Lobby. So Steve alluded to some of the bad news that's been out lately. The, we had a bad Supreme Court decision that limited the power of the EPA and then just this week we got the news that Joe Manchin is a no on the Democrats' major climate spending proposal, which probably means the whole thing goes down. Uh, which means there isn't a whole lot coming from this democratic trifecta on climate change other than, than limited executive actions. So there's a lot of doom and gloom right now in the climate community, and I'm gonna give you the case for why things are actually kind of hopeful and where, where we're leveraging that hope. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as, as people in CCL say, optimism is a political choice. We choose that and it is a political tool for us and it is useful. So these are on the screen are some of our core values. We are a grassroots lobbying group. Almost everybody is volunteer. We have one paid person in Utah and he's the regional coordinator over the whole Mountain West. Um, everybody else, including myself, does this on our volunteer time. We do a lot of talking to legislators, both state and federal, and we do a lot of training of our members on how to talk to legislators and how to talk to the public about climate change in ways that actually move the conversation forward. We try to bring both parties together on effective solutions. We don't work for candidates, we don't uh, endorse candidates, we don't try to get people elected or kicked out of office. 
we try to move everybody who's in office towards better climate action. So this is a picture of us long ago. Uh, I'm in the picture, my wife's in the picture, my daughter's in the picture, and uh, former Representative Mia Love from Utah, and she had these things to say about CCL. CCL comes in and they say, this is a problem we have and we're wondering if you can help us solve it instead of that you're the problem. I had no idea before I started doing this that it was ever possible to change any politician's mind about anything. <laughs> I would never have thought it was possible. I'm doing this because I think it's the best way, but I'm not really sure I believed it could be done. She was the first person who convinced me that politicians can change their minds. She was the first one from Utah who really started talking about climate change, and she is not in office now, but she opened the door for the others to follow. Um, she was the one who started making it politically acceptable for Republicans to talk climate change. And uh, she's young, her staff is young. Young people are generally less resistant to this topic than older people. And she had exactly the right attitude, which is I don't even understand why this is a partisan issue. This affects all of us and we all ought to be solving it. This is John Curtis, who's in office now. I won't play this video because it's kind of quiet, but this is him speaking at a CCL conference in March about saying very similar things to what Mia Love said about the effect that CCL volunteers had on his position. I think he came in more friendly to the topic than she did, partly because it's six years later. Um, he's also on the younger side for a member of Congress. But um, he, the, he's talking about the way he was approached with appreciation and respect instead of as the enemy, as making him want to be an ally for this rather than an opponent. And he has now formed in Congress the Conservative Climate Caucus, which now has a third of all of the Republicans in the House on it. That is enormous progress. When I started doing this, there was no Republican in Congress willing to even say the words climate change. The first tenet of that caucus is that climate change is happening and humans have an effect on it. So that is enormous political progress. It's not enough, but we have to celebrate what we're getting. We were just in DC a couple weeks ago. Uh, Dalen in the, in the group here is, uh, was on that trip. We, we had seven students among our group from Utah and we, uh, we give stipends to the students to help cover their travel costs because we like having young people there. Um, we met with three of the six offices in Utah in person, the other ones virtually. And then the other picture there is the Democratic staff of the House Natural Resources Committee. But we do a lot of this kind of thing, actually meeting face to face. I won't spend a lot of time on this. This has been our primary ask uh, almost every time we've gone, carbon pricing. Carbon pricing right now in today's uh, price environment, today's economy, is a very tough sell. So we focused on other things. But I want to just say it, it remains the best policy for addressing climate change to both cut emissions and protect low-income families. And right now, with today's prices, low-income families are being hurt. So the basic idea is you charge a price on fossil fuel emissions and you give the money back to people. You gradually tilt the economics towards the cleaner sources of energy. Briefly, this is what we were lobbying for a few weeks ago. The Growing Climate Solutions Act lets farmers get paid for practices that put carbon in the soil. Curtis and Romney are both co-sponsors on that. National Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Strategy Act directs the federal government to start planning for the effects of climate change. Curtis is an original co-sponsor on that. Save Our Sequoias Act does uh, fire mitigation in Sequoia National Forest, which is currently threatened. 20% of all the sequoias in the country were lost in the last couple of years to wildfire, increasingly intense wildfire. Curtis and Moore are now co-sponsors on that. Uh, Moore signed on at our request as a result of these lobby meetings. The Forest Act is aimed at curbing international deforestation, which is the second biggest source of greenhouse gases after fossil fuels. We do not yet have a Utah co-sponsor on that one, and we're working on it. Uh, enhancing Geothermal Production on Federal Lands Act streamlines the permitting process for new geothermal wells, which we have a lot of potential for in Utah. 
it currently takes about three times as long to permit a geothermal well as it does to permit an oil and gas well. That's dumb. <laughs> that one right now has only Republican co-sponsors and it's pretty cool for us to be lobbying uh, our legislators for something that is coming from the Republican side. The Heater Act is uh, subsidies for heat pumps to get off of natural gas for heating buildings, and that one right now has only Democratic co-sponsors, but we think it's one that both parties should be able to support. We don't just lobby in DC. This is a hike we just did uh, a few weeks ago with Congressman Curtis. Unlike everybody else, we get, we might, when we go to DC, we might get 30 or 60 minutes with a staffer normally in these offices. With John Curtis, that's a five hour hike. We have enough time not just to talk policy, but to talk about kids and pets and everything else and really get to know each other. It's a whole different relationship than we have with everybody else. The amount of access he gives us is just incredible. And then the bottom left picture there is us at a parade in Park City. And the bottom right is uh, in Emory County, talking to two Emory County commissioners, this is the heart of coal country, at their new energy research center. This is an attempt to, to put people to work outside of the coal industry because the coal industry is dying. Okay, very briefly on what we have to do with the economy. How am I on time, Steve? You've got about four more minutes. Perfect. Yeah. This is international greenhouse gas emissions, global. Uh, the two dashed lines there are showing the trajectories we would have to hit to keep it to two degrees C of warming and to keep it to one and a half degrees C of warming. Realistically, there is no political path to hitting one and a half degrees C of warming anymore. That, uh, that opportunity has gone. With a great deal of effort, we could still follow the two degree path. And we should, and every tenth of a degree matters. These are the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, and what I really want you to know about this is that two of them are already going in the right direction. Those are electricity generation and vehicles, road transportation. Electricity generation in the US is going strongly in the right direction. We want those things to go faster, and we need to tackle the other sources as well, but there's already good news. The market is wanting to move in a cleaner direction already. This is US electricity generation. The steeply declining one there is the highest polluting source, that's coal. And the sharply rising one, the green one, is renewables. We are already now between renewables and nuclear, over 40% carbon free electricity generation in the US and that's gonna accelerate dramatically in the coming years because pretty much all we're building right now in the electricity system is wind and solar. It is the cheapest thing and therefore that's what people are building. What we build today is what we use to generate power tomorrow. Coal is on the way out. Again, we'd like this to go faster, but it's heading in the right direction. This is cars. Car, the, the speed that, that the car industry is gonna flip is gonna turn people's heads. Um, US is a laggard here. We're about 5% EVs. Everybody else is ahead of us um, and growing by leaps and bounds, and that's gonna happen in the US in the next couple of years too. So if you clean up electricity and you clean up cars, you've done something like half of greenhouse emissions in the US. And of course, what, the, what the rest of the world does matters too. It's very important that China is going all EV. That leaves us the rest to tackle, and those matter as well. So final point, the widespread expectation lately is that Republicans will take either one or both houses of Congress in the next election. The doom and gloom narrative in, among, in the climate community is, okay, climate action is off until Democrats take power again. We don't agree at all. There's a lot that can be done in a Republican Congress. There's a lot can be done with our legislators. This is what I'm showing here is the recently unveiled Republican climate agenda. Very limited detail, lots still to be fleshed out. There's one item I wanna highlight that I think is very hopeful. Democrats have not talked about this issue nearly enough. I alluded to it briefly with geothermal. 
it's very hard to get permits right now. The permitting process for clean electricity projects is very slow and we need it to go faster. The faster we can build these things, the faster we can decarbonize. That one, I think there's major room for, uh, for an acceleration of decarbonization that, that both parties can support. Thank you, Todd. Um, next up, we have Lexi Tuttenham, and she's the Executive Director of Healthy Environment Alliance of Utah, otherwise known as HEAL Utah. And HEAL promotes renewable energy and clean air and protects public health and the environment from dirty, toxic, and nuclear energy threats through empowering grassroots action and advocates, also creating science-based solutions and developing common sense policy that centers on the most impacted communities. She's been professionally engaged in building healthy relationships between people and the environment for nearly 20 years um, in communities such as China, Nepal, and all over the US. And um, she previously led a conservation organization out of Colorado. So, very good. Let's go, Lexi. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, and thank you to Steve and, and to the other panelists today. I'm really excited for the, this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about my personal history and background on these issues, and then also talk about specifically what HEAL does, and then I'm going to follow up with um, what we can all be doing. So, <clears throat> so just a little bit of background, because I think it's important to know who is telling you these things, right? And to, to, to have some identity attached to that person and understand where they're coming from. So as Steve mentioned, I've been professionally engaged on environmental advocacy, experiential, experiential education, sustainable development, and conservation for a long time. And I grew up in the LA area in the 80s. My mom's from Hong Kong, and my dad's side of the family were sheep herders in, in um, Wyoming, as well as LDS immigrants, if you will, from the East Coast with Brigham Young. Uh, throughout my life, I've worked in frontline communities in Kathmandu, Nepal, Beijing, China, and Salt Lake, as well as places like Alaska and Haiti. So my whole family are physicians, but I ended up in this different path, mainly because I liked being outside and there were these huge environmental issues that I, once I could see them, I couldn't look away. Right, and I think that's the case for a lot of us. Um, but now, I get to work at the Nexus of Environment and Health, which is really an area where we can ideally convene people from different backgrounds and find something that we can all agree on. My background in ecology gives me understanding of how ecosystem processes under pressure from climate change translate into widespread and inescapable consequences for human health. But my work for several years in these frontline communities many of them who are villages that were several days walk from any sort of a road system, is where I learned how to, critical it is to put people at the center of every pollution, every, every problem, and every single solution. So the Healthy Environment Alliance of Utah promotes renewable energy and clean air, and we protect public health and the environment from dirty, toxic nuclear energy threats. We're an environmental policy nonprofit dedicated to advancing these issues, as well as combating radioactive waste through sound policy and grassroots support. And grassroots means people like all of us here today. We focus on these issues, but we really try to actively work to include environmental justice in every part of every argument that we're looking at. So that means focusing on the most impacted communities and making sure that those people are not only not more victimized by the solutions that we're coming up with, but that we're also making sure that they have opportunities, business and economic opportunities, opportunities for careers, and for the livelihoods that we all deserve moving forward. <clears throat> so here are our three issues. Uh, we started off actually as families against incinerator risk based out of Tooele and Grantsville. And then in 2001, we transitioned to become Heal Utah. Um, as I mentioned before, CCL works a lot on the federal issues. We work some on the federal level, but we work primarily on state level policy. So we work with our legislators. We provide opportunities for citizen lobbying. We work not only during the general session, which was my third week at this job <laughs> this past year, 
pretty intense 45 days there, as well as through multiple levels like municipal. Um, we try to create opportunities throughout the year during interim sessions to just talk to our legislators. And we also do a lot of grassroots organizing and community events and education. Um, we also work extensively with agencies like the D Division of Air Quality on regulatory and administrative processes. So why work on clean air? I mean, that's a pretty obvious <laughs> thing working here. Um, I don't have to answer that for anyone in this room. But I re mostly recently came from Colorado, and even though my, my ancestors lived in Utah, um, I, I was pretty shocked by the air quality because I'm a, raising a one-year-old in this town right now. And so the reason for our air quality are, are multiple, and I, I'm not going to go into that here. But by conservative estimates, pollution costs Utah's economy about $1.8 billion annually. Um, we've also seen work that shows that there are about 2,500 to 8,000 premature deaths annually in Utah, which is obviously a huge concern, not just for um, the communities on the west side or the poorest communities, but for absolutely everyone. And that's something that we can all be united on. Um, the good news is that there's also been work that has shown that for every $30 in economic benefits invested in this issue, um, for every, every $1 invested towards improving air quality, there would be $32 in economic benefits. So I'm just going to cover some super quick air quality basics. Um, when we talk about pollution emission sources, you saw Tom's graphs. Uh, we, we talk about three main sources as well as so-called natural emissions. So vehicle emissions obviously are, are the largest source of emissions on the Wasatch Front right now. Area source emissions, which covers everything from agri agriculture to buildings, are the second largest source, and buildings are going to be, become probably the largest source within a few years. Um, and <clears throat> in addition, we also have industry. So that's often talked about as point source. And obviously, those are also a major source. The main thing with that is that while they're not the largest source of emissions overall, they are some, an area that we can target and actually have an impact. Um, when we talk about natural emissions, we are talking about things that may or may not actually be natural as well. So we're talking about wildfires. We're talking about um, desertifica desertification and dust that's coming from the extreme weather and the climate change cycles that we're seeing. Uh, okay, so a little bit about HEAL's work on energy and climate. So our three main objectives are to reduce carbon emissions, advance renewables, and also advance large-scale renewables. So as we talked about, not only are vehicle and buildings and industry a source of general air pollution, obviously they're a source of greenhouse gas emissions, most critically for this discussion. So there are a lot of solutions there. And we take a number of approaches trying to promote state level legislation. Um, we also tr try to create opportunities for com community action like distributed solar. So for example, we think that one of the major solutions for this area is distributed solar, energy democracy, and renewables like wind and solar, which as Tom mentioned, are so, so much cheaper than anything else right now. They are cost competitive to a level that we have never seen in the history of the world. And finally, um, so, so energy storage has to be part of that solution, right? You often hear this argument that, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And that is not a reason to continue running coal-fired power plants because we have solutions, we have technology that works that involves energy storage and creating a stronger grid with better backups that actually can be responsive to that. <clears throat> um, oh, just to go back for a second, if I can. So I'll, I'll just talk about this. But essentially, one of, one of the opportunities that we do is, is we really try to work from the ground on up, and we try to take the, the, the priorities and the needs that people identify and come to us with, that our community comes to with, us with, and, and communicate that upwards to make that into legislation. Um, so for example, we had a community workshop last year where we were able to work with a local solar company and we created um, customized solutions for various families to figure out if it was actually the right solution for them. Uh, radioactive waste, I'm just gonna touch on briefly. Utah's a downwind state. Um, nuclear is obviously an issue that is under a lot of debate within the environmental community. Heal's stance is very much 
that nuclear is not the solution, it's not on the timeline that we need, it's far more costly than the other options that we're looking for, and it has these huge environmental justice issues that we continue to see today. Um, and um, in particular, we really do see that a lot of those environmental justice impacts, not only in Utah, but around the world, are centered on indigenous communities. So we are currently working in southeast Utah with the White Mesa Ute Mountain Ute community, which is dealing with um, air pollution as well as air, water and land contamination from the energy fuels processing plant, which processes uranium as well as some other rare earth metals. <clears throat> so what does health and environmental justice have to do with climate change? Everything, obviously, right? So we talk about climate change feedback loops, emissions from these sources, which directly affect health, desertification and drought, which affects everything from our food security to our ability to go outside, um, extreme weather, heat, we certainly know right now that um, while heat is a huge issue for all of us, areas that have less tree cover, so example, I live, currently live in West Jordan on the west side where there's less tree cover, and there are more heat islands that tend to affect people who have lower income and less resources to pay for cooling. Wildfire um, and even pollen is something that's affected by climate change. So one of the major things that we do focus on is making sure that the past, present, and future pollution of air, land, and water due to extraction are not Placed, placing a greater burden on those communities that have already been more affected. <clears throat> and so we focus on science-based policy solutions, grassroots engage engagement. We really focus on the alliance part of our name. So we partner with organizations, everything from CCL to Utah Community Action to work at every single level and really build out a community that is focused on this and works on it from multiple angles. We also engage with lawmakers on their own terms. <clears throat> And we really think that environmental justice is also social justice. So just an example of this. Um, recently, Utah got a grant from the EPA to work with researchers at the University of Utah, the Utah Transit Authority, Salt Lake County, Salt Lake City, amongst others, to do real-time air quality monitoring on e-buses that are running. There's, a, there's one route that we're monitoring on the west side, and there's a control route that we're monitoring on the east side. We already know that there are disparities between those two routes in terms of air quality. But what this is going to do is that it's going to provide a real-time site where people from the community can access that data and make personal choices to protect their own health. In addition to that, what U Heals Utah's role is in all of that is to help communicate that to a larger community as a, as a whole and then give that message up to lawmakers so that these people can go and lobby for themselves and talk to their elected officials to communicate the need for change. <clears throat> Um, we also do a lot of bar bipartisan work. As we know, the Utah State Legislature is a Republican supermajority, so there's no possible way that we could just work with our Democrats. We work with Republicans, and we try to really find those solutions in common and those values in common that we can connect with them on. So we don't always have to talk about climate change. In some cases, we can talk about lived experience of drought, air quality, heat, and so on. We can talk about these values that Tom already mentioned, so economics, free market, business values, as well as supporting vulnerable communities and families. <clears throat> we talk often about incentives, not just regulation, although we do know that both are needed. And one example of the, something that we were able to get through the legislature this year was a diesel emissions reduction bill. So we worked with the fabulous Senator Escamilla, and her leadership was key in getting this through. But what we did was we, we created a bill that was based on a program out of Texas. It was key that it was out of Texas. If it, it, if it had come out of California, there would have been no, no possible that we were going to get it through, right? And so we were able to get this bill passed. It is essentially a very initial study of diesel emissions reduction from all over Utah, but especially the inland port area. We are also focusing on regenerative agriculture and alternative development as a way to, f to get rural communities on board and talking with us because rural communities in Utah have to be part of the solution. They're some of the most affected both by the fossil fuel transition and also by things like desertification. And because we have such a strong rural caucus in Utah, it is essential to make sure that those people don't get left behind. Um, talking about what we can do is, as citizens, uh, vote, of course. So environmentalvoter.org voter estimates that over 8 million environmentalists did not vote in the 2020 presidential election and over 12 million skipped the, the 2018 midterms. So there's a very obvious thing that we can do here. And you don't have to identify as an environmentalist. Um, you can become a citizen lobbyist. We run citizen lobbying trainings 
and information sessions and opportunities every single week during the session and then for every single interim session as well. Um, you can also testify and give public comment on many other processes. You could run for office. You get to know your representatives, like Representative Curtis, which I had I recently got to work with CCL and, and go on a hike with him. Um, and we also need to hold, hold our corporations accountable and innovate and change norms so that better choices are available. And then finally, I recently came across this model for figuring out <coughs> your best personal climate action from Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. So it's basically the idea that you have to figure out what you are sustainable personally in, as well as figuring out what needs doing. So the first part of the Venn diagram is what brings you joy, right? And I think that's a really important thing because there's so much opportunity for despair here. And then what are you good at personally? And then finally, what work needs doing? And then in that intersection of those Venn diagrams, that could be your climate action. And if you need to know, what sort of work needs doing. There are so many resources out there. There's Project Drawdown's Table of Solutions. Heal Heal has many opportunities as well. You can join an organization and learn more. Um, and then the most important thing of all, and this is actually where I got to connect with some of these people, is to talk to people. So Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who, who gave a presentation at the university back in um, the spring, <clears throat> talks a lot about the need to talk to people in whatever terms you can find in common. And it doesn't have to be the correct terms, they just have to be values that you can share. <clears throat> and, and so finally, just a, a recap of, of what I've already mentioned. So you can participate in decision-making processes, you can support just energy, energy energy transition, you can make better consumer choices, including consuming less, um, making better transit choices, and it, a lot of that has to do with smart growth planning. So working, making both the choices that make sh sure that you don't have this moral, uh, this cognitive dissonance and that your values do align with what you're actually doing, but then working on up to figure out how you can create a ripple effect. And then finally, this is my son Martin making a smart, active transit choice. <laughs> right. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Lexi. Okay, um, we're going to take a few minutes now. We're going to pass the plate, as Mark suggested earlier. Please give generously. And then also, by all means, talk, get to know your neighbors, particularly ones you haven't met before. We are going to go to Q&A now, and the way we're going to work this is raise your hand, we'll alternate sides of the room, for those of you in the back room can raise your hand and one of us will go up there. Um, for those of you who are on virtually, you can type a question into the chat, and we have someone here who will relay that question, and as Mark said at the beginning, try and make the questions concise. Hi, um, I'm most concerned about the toxic dust that's coming out of the Great Salt Lake. And I did listen to something on PBS a while ago that there were um, actions to put more water in the Great Salt Lake. Could you um, amplify on that a little bit, please? Sure. So do you want to talk about Salt Lake? Um, you can go ahead and I'll go a second. Okay, so I, <laughs> I won't talk about some of the water rights issues. So... Can't hear you. Oh, here. <laughs> There we go. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, we are all very concerned about the toxic dust coming off of the Great Salt Lake. And I think one of the, thing, the things that we need to keep it as a part of that conversation is that it's not just a water issue, right? It's a climate change emergency. And so making sure that we are not just putting a Band-Aid over that, um, although we absolutely need water in there, but you can't create more at some point. So the, some of the things that have been going on to try to address the water issue have been uh, such strategies like there was an in-stream flow rights bill that was, that was passed through the legislature this year by Republican legislators, and that is fantastic because what we need to do is that we need to understand 
that agriculturalists in particular are really stressed by climate change and by water, lack of water. Um, but many states like Colorado and Utah have had this use it or lose it policy. Uh, but an in-stream flow right basically allows a water rights holder to lease that right to the river for ecological uses without losing it over the long term. Because a lot of people have had these water rights for you know, centuries in many cases, and they don't want to lose them. It's, it's very scary to lose that. But allowing it to, allowing water flowing down the river to actually have a use and it, have it not be something that you're going to lose over the long term is, is one piece of that puzzle. There's also, of course, $40 million that was earmarked in this past state legislature to work on solutions to the Great Salt Lake issue. Um, I believe the Nature Conservancy is, is going to be working on a lot of easements and, and water rights issues uh, related to that. But it, it's going to entail everything from upstream conservation to uh, perhaps what Jesse's going to talk about here. Yeah, I'm sure I can expand much more on that. I think the in-stream flow rights are one of the big issues. Um, we are working in Salt Lake City to make sure that our effluent from the water reclamation facility, uh, 30 million gallons a day, is going to be earmarked for the Great Salt Lake. But we're also working with other uh, water providers and irrigators um, across the state, really, for water conservation. And hopefully that can then also go to the GSL, or GSL. I always say the GSL, but it's just Great Salt Lake. So uh, I think, yeah. I can't really expand much more on what you were saying there. Yeah, and I, I would say there, there are some other pro progressive water things moving forward. Everything from water conservation for, for new appliances to um, secondary water metering. So, so, for example, the water that comes out of your tap is metered, but a lot of the other water isn't. So making sure that we're keeping track of all of that, and we have to improve efficiency. We have to reduce use. And that is everything from also making sure that HOAs don't mandate park strips that are lawn and allowing people to, to flip to um, zero escaping, for example. There, there's all sorts of fixes there, and it's, it's all part of the solution. And, and one thing along those lines with uh, secondary water, we don't have that much in Salt Lake City, but other areas that do have robust secondary water mm -hmm. systems that are pressurized, they are required to start metering that water use so people have an idea of what's coming through and going onto their, onto their grass or onto their um, whatever they're irrigating might be. Okay. Thank you. Utah is such a business-friendly state and encouraging so many organizations to move here. And I'm sure that the climate is having an impact on that. Uh, but I was wondering, when we are urging companies to come here, are we looking at what their water and electric usage is and how that's going to impact us in the state. And the second question is about agricultural water use. I know when I'm driving, I see the irrigation on in the middle of the day, and it makes me nuts. But I'm not sure if it's because farmers are told they have certain times to irrigate. So can you give us some information about that? I can answer briefly about businesses. Um, Businesses are very concerned about air quality in Utah, and they make hiring decisions based on air quality. We have had less success uh, convincing them to make climate change a priority, and in fact, many businesses move to Utah because electricity is cheap in Utah, which uh, we have particularly dirty electricity generation here. So that's moving in the wrong direction. Um, but the business community is one of our hopes for putting additional pressure on the legislature, and they're starting to speak up now, specifically about climate change. Uh, the coming Olympic bid is also going to be very hopeful for that, because the state right now does not look good to the IOC in terms of our electricity generation. I'd say one thing about uh, water usage. Uh, I can't speak for the rest of the state, but Salt Lake City recently passed ordinance limiting the amount of water industry can use during any given uh, time period. And so that's going to, again, that goes towards our uh, supply and demand master plan that takes us out to 2060 so that we can kind of watch the type of growth we're having come through. Uh, we redo that about every five years so we're staying on top of things. But, but it is something that at least the city's taking some steps to limit uh, the types of industries that might come through for the big water users. Yeah, and specifically with respect to agriculture, I honestly haven't worked as much 
on that in my current capacity, but in my past capacity, worked on public lands issues, water in Colorado. I know that one of the things that a lot of farmers are dealing with is, is that they have infrastructure that works a certain way, right? And they've done it a certain way. And many of those things are, it's a multi-generational farm, but there's, if we can provide support for infrastructure improvements, for technology developments, there are new practices, regenerative agriculture, and, and you know, a lot of things get greenwashed, right? And so we really need to vet them to make sure that they're actual solutions, that they're actually creating change on top of what we would already be seeing. But if we can create incentives to support farmers to make some of those changes so that they're not perhaps irrigating in the middle of the day, and they have ways to um, actually make those changes, then they're going to see an economic benefit as well. And so, but, but it, sometimes it takes some support to get them there. And a lot of research, too, to, to prove out the data points. All right. Thank you. Um, I had a question principally for Tom with the CCO, but also any of the other panelists are welcome to answer, too. Uh, Tom mentioned that optimism is a political tool when addressing climate change. Um, but my question is a lot of your presentation, sorry, you can't see me, I'm over here. Um, a lot of your presentation talked about optimism as far as political activism and political will and solutions going forward, which I think is important. But a question I had is, um, by your own presentation, it seems like the most optimistic um, reality of climate change is that we're probably going to be seeing two degrees increase um, Celsius in temperature change based on current trends and what political will exists. And I wondered if you could comment on just how optimism can be a tool not only for optimism concerning the political will to change, but also optimism when we consider the fact that the climate is going to change. And we're probably going to be seeing a more hostile world in the future, regardless of the political actions we're able to enact today. That, that is a great question. I guess I would answer optimism tempered by realism. <clears throat> the, um, the speed with which we can decarbonize depends not just on political will, but on the cost of the infrastructure that we have already built. Hardly anybody is willing to throw away recently built infrastructure, whether that's you with your car or your furnace, or whether that's the power company with a recently built power plant. Generally, these things live out the end of their service lives and then get replaced. And so, with, with limited exceptions, the fastest we can decarbonize is to replace each thing at the end of its service life with its clean alternative. So that's what, when I say we're, we practically have lost the opportunity to hit 1.5, it's because of the recently built infrastructure, right? That we're, that there's just, it's not just political will, that it is a huge hit on the economy to, to assume that we're just gonna throw those things away, not just in this country, but in the, in the rest of the world as well. So I would say optimism is extremely valuable politically. Legislators respond much better in, in words like Mia loves when we treat them as partners and allies and approach them optimistically that there is hope that they will agree with us and that we will agree with them. And uh, for the climate system, realism. Two degrees C is bad. It's much worse than 1.5 degrees C. It is uh, overwhelmingly unlikely to be catastrophic for the human, for human civilization. We can probably handle two degrees C. It will be painful. We should try to limit it and not go beyond that if we possibly can. And I would just add to that, I think a lot of the planning that we have to do right now is not just about mitigation, which we still have to do, we absolutely have to decarbonize, but planning for adaptation and resilience. And that's a lot of what Jesse is doing. I uh, want to just say another thing about the shrinking of Great Salt Lake, which is, a lot. Oh, <laughs> the shrinking of Great Salt Lake. Also, if it's windy, windy day, wear a mask because there's arsenic in the sand. So if it's, you know, it's not raining, it's not snowing, but it's really windy, you still need a mask because of the arsenic in the sand. Actually, I'd like to 
address that one a little if I can. <laughs> so my, what I did professionally was evaluate toxic waste sites. And one of the things I did, one of the last projects I did, was involved with dust from the Great Salt Lake. And there was the article in the paper with the professor from the University of Utah. And I will say, first of all, my data, the data I used came from him, but it's from several years ago now. And I don't know if he has more recent data. It's the arsenic at that time that he had found was not that high. What was high is just the total level of dust that would come off in some of these storms from the Salt Lake. That was just terrible. Um, but I don't know if anyone else has more recent data from him, but if not, the arsenic levels, when I saw them in the newspaper, to me that part of it seemed overblown, unless there's something else that's been found. I, I would just say on top of that, that, that so it is certainly a good idea to wear a mask when there are clearly a dust plume coming from the Great Salt Lake. Not just because of the arsenic, which is one of the most alarming things that has been named in a lot of articles, but there are heavy metals. And the particulate matter itself, we know that that is where we see increases in hospitalizations, in particular on days when there are high, there's high particulate matter, and, and particularly the PM 2.5, the really small particles that get really deep into your lungs and, and cause everything from short-term increases in stroke to long-term increases in chronic conditions like diabetes and e even to you know low birth rate, fetal issues. It, it's, it's a good idea. Okay. Question is, uh, we see the problem here with the second driest state. We're in a record drought uh, and heat for the last 1,200 years. Question with regard to uh, water rates increasing the cost of water, scarcity, and to what extent that would help us if we started replacing lawns with rocks that you don't have to mow or water. And also here in Utah, second driest state, to be able to have more drought resistant Utah native plants that to collectively together would help to ease our problems here. I think this one's for me. <laughs> um, so I think with the, with the we do have a tiered rate st schedule now, so the more you use, the more you pay. Um, we are doing another rate study this coming year where we're putting the uh, request for proposals after that right now. Um, one thing we have to look at with that is the social equity of it and making it affordable. It still has to be affordable for all our income classes. Um, we can't just simply charge more because then we will charge people out of the market. And so what we're gonna be looking at is how to continue that um, rate structures so that we can have everybody afford water, but again, the more you use, the more you might have to pay. And it's, so we do have a, we do have a, a tiered rate structure now. Um, in terms of um, more drastic measures of uh, taking out uh, lawns and gardens and things like that, we're not there yet, but who knows where we'll be in the future. Uh, we do partner with other conservancy agencies for things like Flip Your Strip uh, to do that. We're working with USU to uh, look at more drought tolerant plants. We're actually doing some demos on those on some of our, you know, our pump stations that we haven't already zero escaped. We're gonna try some of these just as a demos. Uh, golf and parks are working with some of those. So I think you make great points. Um, it's just a matter of how does that, how do we implement that um, to, make it, to make it beneficial for, for all users as we go forward. But this new rate study, rate study we're putting together will be addressing some of that. Um, my question is in regard to a small thing, but it is um, very frustrating and typical of the state where economic development is put above the, uh, and profit for the state is put above the health of, of our people. And that is, there, there's a facility, a very, very large facility, um, and uh, down off of uh, I-15 I uh, South, um, where they collect data um, from all of us. It's, a, it's huge, a huge warehouse. And I know with the, all the computers, it requires a lot of water to keep the computers um, at, at a level that they can still function. That never should have been. And is there, any, is there anybody that is addressing that and, and saying, get this out of our state? I, I... I can't specifically speak to that data center, and, and I know what you're talking about. It's, it's very alarming, and of course, I think a lot of us are hearing about crypto mining, and that is essentially 
the amount of energy, the intensity of that energy, and often coal-fired energy, as well as water use, that is going to fuel this entirely new economy. Um, I know that there was a crypto mining bill in the legislature this year uh, that I believe did not pass. But I, I, I hear your point about um, the, the idea that this state is friendly to business and not necessarily good for our health. But I will say that I think there's absolutely an argument where, as Tom mentioned, we are seeing businesses not willing to relocate and not willing to invest here because their employees won't live here because of the air quality issues. And so air quality and water, these are places that are proxies where we can talk about climate change with this business community and, and talk about the bottom line. There need to be studies that sh demonstrate that, and there are a lot of those out already, but our legislators need to hear directly from those people and get those numbers and understand that it is affecting their bottom line. Um, with respect to that particular data center, I, I think there's this is maybe a good opportunity to create a bill specifically focusing on data centers like that that we bring to a legislator who is perhaps from that district and is whose constituents are worried about that water use and, and that, that climate impact. We have a question from the video audience. Yeah, uh, here's a question from Allison Christensen. <laughs> Uh, she asks, although the LDS Church has made small recent nods to water conservation, it feels too late and too little of a gesture. Can anyone comment on their commitment to water conservation for the hundreds of meeting houses throughout the state and seem to require a large amount of landscape water usage? Do they have a plan for future planning? I... <laughs> um, I I won't be able to answer this. Yeah. I was hoping Jesse could, but I do want to throw in something that, and throw it to Jesse, that indoor water use, if we're talking about the Great Salt Lake, is very different than outdoor water use. And I learned this from Jesse, so I'm saying this on his behalf. Indoor water use ends up in the lake in the end. It goes through the water treatment plant, it still goes to the lake. Outdoor water use does not. Yeah, and I think, I know, there, I know the uh, LDS Church has made some strides in this. I can't comment on what they're, overarching policy is on, uh, on, on conservation. I think they are taking part in conservation efforts, but I couldn't comment on specifics for them. I've got another question here from Zoom, which you might be able to answer. <laughs> um, what is the possibility for gray water diversion for individual residences to water lawns and gardens? So gray water, that's, that's oftentimes uh, mandated by county health departments. Uh, right now, it's not it's not in full throttle any place that I'm aware of, but that's something that would have to go through county health. Uh, again, as Tom mentioned, uh, water that goes into our pipe system as culinary water is typically going to indoor water use will go down down drains and out to our collection systems and out to our treatment plant and then to the Great Salt Lake. Outdoor water for lawns um, that's that's a different beast that either goes into the 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 um, grass or shrubs or into the groundwater or down in stormwater. But uh, um, as far as gray water, I know there's been some push for that, but I'm not sure where that stands on a county by county basis. Okay. We're gonna have Mark here and then we're gonna have one more question. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, presenting today. Uh, how do we get the American people fired up about energy, conservation, our climate, uh, because we're t they're told over and over again by the fossil fuel industry that it costs jobs to do anything uh, to mitigate uh, these things, and, and that uh, if you do more solar and wind, that then that will, uh, the people will be unemployed who are in the fossil fuel industry. And on the side of uh, wind and solar, is anything being done to generate hydrogen? Remember, we all learned about electrolysis in school, and uh, we keep hearing about uh, uh, hydrogen-powered uh, fuel cells for cars, and, and also the, uh, bring us up to date on the storage, uh, because that's key. So on hydrogen, the most exciting hydrogen project in the country is happening in Utah right now, Delta, Utah. Uh, federal government just uh, now about a month ago announced a $500 million loan guarantee for a hydrogen storage project in the salt domes. 
Uh, we happen to have perfect geography uh, and transmission already set up to make that practical. So hydrogen effectively just functions as a, a long duration battery. It's surplus power, uh, primarily from wind and solar, that happen at times when you can't otherwise use them. And you, if, they, if you couldn't store them, you'd just be throwing that away. So you store it by creating hydrogen, and then you burn that in a turbine just like a natural gas power plant when you do need it. So hydrogen is super exciting. Uh, in terms of the American public's focus on energy, they are very focused on energy right now, mostly on the cost of gasoline. <laughs> but uh, yeah, people are paying a lot of attention to energy. Uh, jobs, the trouble with um, the jobs conversation, it's not that, like the economy is gonna grow jobs as we build out these clean energy things, solar, wind, transmission lines, geothermal, everything. That's massive job creating potential. The problem with that conversation is the people who lose jobs have names and faces and the ones who gain jobs don't. So it's a very one-sided conversation. Right, and I think that's what we often talk about is just transition. It's not necessarily a politically palatable term in this state, but we can talk about supporting transition communities and essentially creating job retraining, creating alternative economic development. Because oftentimes when that fossil fuel industry goes away, they also lose their tax base, which means all their social services. So how do you support them through that transition? And not just create new opportunity, but make sure that throughout that transition they are able to run a fire department, run their schools, and so on and so forth. With respect to the hydrogen, I just did want to say, all hydrogen is not created equal. There are different, uh, currently they're, they're called different colors of hydrogen. So green hydrogen is hydrogen that is produced through renewable power. There are also things like, quote unquote, blue hydrogen and gray hydrogen, some of which is created from basically methane emissions. It's from the oil and gas industry. If you're, if you're drilling for more oil and gas to create hydrogen, it's not the best idea. And there are some cases in which actually it's been found that hydrogen, hydrogen just needs to be vetted, but there's a lot of interest and excitement um, in the state around it. I'll just add an amen to that, that I should have mentioned that as well. Hydrogen only works for decarbonization if it's produced cleanly. If you're gonna get it from natural gas, you might as well just burn the natural gas. Yeah. All right, one last question. Um, it's exciting to see that passed the um, don't use it or lose it in the legislature, but have any farmers taken us up on that? Have they traded their rights? And second question, if you use gray water, if you take off your gray water, does that mean you're taking water away from the lake? My glasses is off, everything off here. I'll put my glasses back on so I can see you. Um, so I think it, it will take some water away from the lake. Again, the effluent will go through the pipes and out through a treatment plant and out. Uh, it's also, um, there is a downside if we conserve too much, we still need carrier water within the pipes because they're gravity fed to get to the, the facility. So there will be some of that. Um, but I think it's, it's something that could be pursued for gray water use. And what was the other part of your question? The use it or lose it, oh, the, any farmers taking us up on that? Um, I'm, Again, we're, we're more of a municipal system here. Um, I, I don't know if you have any answers. To that. Yeah, so I, I'm pretty sure that, that it was either to be, I can't quite remember the legislation. I believe it's going to be implemented probably July 2023. That's typically how this, the cycle works. Um, I will say that some of the primary sponsors of that legislation were, for example, Representative Joel, Joel Ferry, who is a wheat farmer himself. And so, um, through the, gosh, I can't remember the name of the department right now, but basically the Office of Agricultural Innovation, I'm gonna call it, um, and, and also the Department of Forestry, there are going to be opportunities for outreach and education, and I think we're just not quite there yet. Um, but once again, I think education and infrastructure support as well as educational support, because it does, it's a lot of, it's a lot of um, paperwork to figure out that process. And there, there will be a, a portion of that that if, one farmer passes it down, there is a lot of return water that it's kind of shepherding that down through the system also. So it is not bypassed by one to be taken by another. Well, thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to everyone here. <laughs> Next week, as Mark said, it'll be the UU non-camp out sing-along. 
So please come to that. It should be fun. And come out to Elliott Hall. Go outside. In Elliott Hall, there will be representatives from both Citizens Climate Lobby and from HEAL. If you are interested in either organization, also get to know your neighbor. And thank you. Also coffee.